Justice Breyer framed his lectures, uh, lecture in terms of the compromises that went into forming the first edition of the United States Sentencing Guidelines. Uh, I will frame mine uh, largely in terms of uh, seven distinctions. Uh, that I think are useful to keep in mind, uh, and in some cases uh, to, to sharpen and others to blur uh, as we try to work our way through the system uh, of uh, so-called advisory guidelines that began with United States against Booker uh, uh, six years ago. Uh, the first distinction I want to highlight uh, is that between sentencing policy and penal policy. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, by sentencing uh, policy, I mean the answers to a certain set of primarily procedural questions uh, about the process by which individual convicted offenders are assigned to punishments. Uh, by penal policy, I mean our approach to a more substantive set of questions about the role of punishment in reducing crime. Uh, thus, the breadth of discretion to be assigned to individual judges uh, in uh, sentencing defendants uh, as opposed to the reliance on mandatory uh, sentencing uh, schemes is a question of sentencing policy. Uh, the degree to which we as a society should rely on lengthy terms of imprisonment uh, as our primary response to criminal behavior in general or to a particular type of crime uh, would be a question of penal policy. Uh, the two are not the same, uh, though they're obviously related. Uh, for much of the 20th century, the United States, or at least its legal establishment, uh, espoused a penal philosophy that was officially based on rehabilitation. Uh, though the professed philosophy sounded liberal, uh, we in fact relied very heavily on incarceration as our response to crime. Uh, and while sentence lengths varied considerably across American jurisdictions, extremely high nominal prison terms were the norm. Uh, and with the denial of uh, parole, they often ripened into lengthy actual stays behind bars. Uh, our sentencing policy uh, at that time was one that assigned enormous uh, discretion to individual judges, who often had the right to assign a maximum sentence uh, anywhere from probation to a lengthy term of years or even life in prison. I think when one looks to the federal sentencing guidelines, uh, it's important to make this distinction because critics of uh, the federal sentencing guidelines uh, really came in two flavors, or there were two different types of criticisms. Uh, one was a criticism as a matter of sentencing policy. Uh, it argued that the guidelines were too rigid uh, and didn't give judges enough opportunity uh, to uh, appropriately enhance or mitigate the punishments uh, of particular offenders uh, depending on the particular circumstances of their crime uh, and their history. Uh, that's about sentencing policy. Should there be more discretion or, or less? Should there be more rigidity or less? Uh, a separate criticism uh, was a criticism based in penal policy uh, and was a criticism that thought the federal sentencing guidelines were too severe. Uh, that criticism uh, is just really about the particular guidelines that were in place. Uh, it's not a criticism of guidelines uh, in principle. Uh, the sentencing philosophy criticism is about the idea uh, of uh, mandatory uh, guidelines. Uh, the fourth distinction I want to make uh, is between uh, mandatory and advisory uh, guidelines. Uh, and this is a distinction I'd like to blur. Uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, the perception is that in 2005 the federal sentencing system moved from a very rigid system of mandatory uh, guidelines uh, to a very uh, lax uh, system of uh, advisory uh, guidelines. But mandatory and advisory are slippery terms. Uh, let's start at the mandatory end of the spectrum. Uh, about the only truly mandatory absolute constraints on sentencing that have operated on federal judges throughout recent history, indeed uh, throughout all of history, are statutory maximum sentences. A judge has no discretion under the law uh, to impose a sentence higher than the statutory maximum. A sentence that violates this rule has always been reversible on appeal, even when the general unappealability of sentences was firmly established law. Mandatory guidelines were never even mandatory in that less than absolute sense of the statutory minimum terms. Justice Breyer repeatedly emphasized uh, that the statute, the Sentencing Reform Act, uh, permitted judges to depart, uh, as it was called, uh, from the range dictated uh, by the guidelines uh, 
uh, when the court found, quote, that there exists an aggravating or mitigating circumstance of a kind or to a degree that was not adequately taken into consideration by the sentencing guidelines. Uh, in that sense, it seems to me, the guidelines should always have been called presumptive uh, rather than mandatory. The sentence was expected to be within the guideline range most of the time, and the judge did not have unconstrained discretion to depart. The judge had to meet a legal standard before uh, giving a sentence outside the guideline range, and appellate review was permitted for departures, but not for the refusal to depart. Uh, so certain counter incentives were created to uh, outside the guideline uh, sentences. Uh, on the other hand, the standard was a lot less precise than the very specific criteria for escaping from a statutory uh, minimum sentence, and it left the courts with considerable discretion. Uh, most of the fighting uh, for the uh, uh, nearly 20 years of guideline sentencing uh, was uh, just how powerful that presumption uh, was supposed to be. Uh, congressional rhetoric, including occasional threats to bring judges before congressional committees to explain themselves, uh, and the predominant characterization by the bar and uh, uh, the press uh, as of the guidelines as mandatory, created a perception uh, that judges should rarely depart and, and did so at their peril. But the standard actually adopted by the Congress in legislation was clearly open-ended. Uh, Justice Breyer, an original member of the Sentencing Commission, who indeed is widely seen as the author of the first set of guidelines, uh, emphasized the importance of departures, uh, not only in his Hofstra lecture, uh, but also in the commentary to the guidelines themselves. Ultimately, when the Supreme Court ended the mandatory guidelines era in Booker, it did so in part by insisting that the guidelines were indeed sufficiently mandatory to trigger the Apprendi prohibition on judicial fact-finding that increased a mandatory maximum sentence. And it did so over the objection of Justice Breyer, uh, who insisted to the last, uh, and in my view correctly, that the guidelines were not, in fact, the equivalent of statutory maximums and that contrary to the majority's view, a defendant had no vested right to a sentence lower uh, than the top of the guidelines range, because after all, upward departures were permitted, uh, and that the only absolute right a defendant had uh, was the right not to be sentenced above the statutory maximum. So mandatory guidelines, not quite as mandatory as their reputation. Uh, uh, what about advisory guidelines? Uh, the conventional wisdom among academics has been that advisory guidelines are mostly useless in changing sentencing practices because judges are too arrogant to take the advice. Uh, accordingly, when the federal guidelines were demoted to advisory uh, in the wake of Booker, the concern was that the guidelines would quickly lose their potency. But like mandatory guidelines, advisory ones come in various flavors, some uh, more advisory than others. Uh, judges are certainly used to getting and ignoring advice about sentencing from all kinds of sources. Uh, but uh, is the weight that we can expect advisory guidelines to have the same uh, as those of the advice one might get from the television screen? Uh, well, I'm sure there are some judges who have very strong views about sentencing and a high degree of, shall we call it, self-confidence uh, about the correctness of their views. Uh, such judges may have little interest in the views of the Sentencing Commission or anyone else. Uh, I doubt, however, that that is the case for most judges. Uh, we might well have views about penal policy in general uh, or about whether the particular defendant before us is worthy of leniency or severity. It may be objected that what I've been talking about so far is more a psychological prediction about how judges especially federal judges who've been used to mandatory guidelines for a generation, are likely to respond to advisory guidelines. Uh, perhaps those psychological effects will wear off, uh, and is that the same as saying that the guidelines have legal force? But the post-Booker guidelines do have legal force. Uh, what do I mean by that? First, the Supreme Court has made clear that the guidelines must be calculated and calculating accurately as the first step in every sentence. Moreover, the advice of the Sentencing Commission is not just out there in the same way as the editorial writers or law professors for the judge to consult or not as she chooses. It must be consulted in every case. Once consulted, moreover, it may not be ignored. 
the statute lists the guidelines as one of the factors that must be considered by the court, along with such traditional policy factors as the offender's personal characteristics or the need for adequate deterrence in selecting the sentence in appropriate cases.